All right, what's up, guys? So, Fact Faction has uploaded another five mysterious unsolved cases. Yeah, let's go ahead and get into this video. This uh, this one being number 11. Yeah, if you guys haven't, though, go subscribe to Fact Faction. They always upload um, interesting and good videos. Videos that leaves me hooked. You know, videos where I'm all like, nah, bro, I gotta watch the next one. You know, so yeah, if you guys haven't, definitely go show Fact Faction some love and support. Be greatly appreciated. But anyways, let's go ahead and get into this video. On the evening of May 16, 2006, Allison Rivera arrived at her hotel for a three- to four-day business trip and called home to chat with her new husband, Ray. Unable to reach him for a few hours, she grew concerned and called Claudia, a friend who was staying with the couple in their Baltimore, Maryland home. Claudia said that Ray was not around. He had received a call sometime during the late afternoon that prompted him to curse and rush out of the house, and she had no idea where he could have gone. As more and more time slipped by with no word from her husband, Allison grew anxious and cut her trip short to return to Baltimore. Rallying family, friends, associates, and co-workers, she began to search the city, but there was no sign of him. Finally, on May 22nd, six days after Ray was last seen, his car was discovered in a paid parking lot outside the Belvedere Hotel in downtown Baltimore. According to the parking attendant, the car arrived after 6 p.m. on the 16th and had been there ever since. This area was known to the Riveras. Ray worked from home, but his employer had an office just across the street from the building. Two days later, two of his co-workers decided to spend their lunch break looking for Ray and ventured up to the roof of a parking structure adjacent to the hotel. From their vantage point, they could see one flip-flop, a bunch of keys, a phone, and a pair of glasses near a large hole in the roof of the structure's south wing. The police were promptly summoned and swiftly discovered Ray's body in an unused conference room directly beneath the hole. He had sustained severe injuries, some consistent with a fall from a significant height, while others were not. An additional flip-flop yeah. was found near Ray's body, but his distinctive money clip remained missing. Baltimore police surmised that Ray had taken his own life, jumping from a higher roof point on the Belvedere Hotel. However, his phone and glasses were unscathed, and to jump and land where he did, he would have had to run at a pace of 10 miles per hour, which is the pace for an average fit male sprinting in sports shoes. Rivera, though tall and in relatively good shape, was either barefoot or wearing flip-flops. A second theory that he may have jumped from a ledge rather than the roof seemed plausible at first. It was closer to the portion of the south wing he fell through, but this was still unlikely. The only access to the ledge was through privately owned condos and offices. That's what I'm saying. I'm about like, how, like how I imagine you, there's like probably some sort of way you have to get there. They ain't gonna just allow you to just go out there, or not more so the ledge, but just in that area. But anyways, ultimately, the medical examiner classified Rivera's cause of death as undetermined. Looking for answers, Allison searched his home office, finding a note behind his computer. Folded up into a two-inch square and jammed with tiny lines of text, the note was illogical, referencing famous Hollywood names, movie titles, Freemasonry quotes, and other ramblings. Some of this made sense to Allison, who revealed that her husband had dreams of relocating to Southern California to pursue a career in the movie business. She also told authorities that he had become interested in the Freemasons, calling up a local lodge to inquire about joining and buying the book Freemasons for Dummies. The FBI analyzed the strange document, stating it was not a suicide note, but they could find no viable information in it. The Baltimore Police Department ruled his death as a probable suicide, despite the strange circumstances and his yeah, family. To me, that just don't that don't sound right. It could be the case, but it just to me that just don't sound right. I'm like, I it sounds like something else was going on behind the scenes, and then maybe that was their cover up. I don't know, but it just something don't seem right. His insistence that he had no reason to take his own life. His family remains hopeful that one day his death will be explained, but for now, Allison and the rest of the Rivera family are left with nothing but haunting questions surrounding the demise of their beloved husband, son, and brother. Yeah, I just, to me, my thing is this, it's like, 
I definitely, if I'm that, and she most likely did, I'm asking friends, I'm asking family, I'm doing my own investigation, because I'm like, to that, that's just something just doesn't seem right with that picture. I feel like something else had to have been going on behind the scenes. I don't know what, but that's what it just sounds like to me, you know, and then, yeah, but who knows, maybe he was going through some stuff, and then, yeah, you know, it's, uh, he, if he did take his life, he did, but yeah, I just, I feel like that there's more to the story that was, you know, that wasn't told, so, but anyways. On December 18th, 2011, 23-year-old Phoenix Colden left her family's home in Spanish Lake, Missouri, and jumped into her mother's 1998 black Chevy Blazer just before 3 p.m. When it hit midnight, with no sign of Phoenix, Goldia and Lawrence Colden began to fear the worst. Where was their daughter? Homeschooled as a child, Phoenix was a talented musician and a local fencing superstar. As a University of Missouri St. Louis student, Phoenix seemed to have a bright future ahead of her. And, according to her parents, a sudden and unexplained disappearance was uncharacteristic. As authorities searched for answers surrounding Phoenix's vanishing, a hidden life was soon revealed. She wasn't enrolled at her university anymore, and she had a secret boyfriend. He was questioned at the beginning of the investigation, but it was quickly determined he was not involved in his girlfriend's disappearance. Unbeknownst to the Coldens, just a few hours after Phoenix left home, Goldia's Chevy Blazer was discovered abandoned in East St. Louis, Illinois, a roughly 20-minute drive southeast of the Colden family home. The car was left in the middle of a traffic lane in a particularly crime-ridden area of the city, Sadly, due to clerical errors, the Coldens were not alerted to the discovery of their vehicle until about two weeks later. Unfortunately, there are very few answers in Phoenix's case. No one knows why she might have driven to East St. Louis. Her cell phone data had been analyzed by the authorities, but the details of their findings are unknown. About three years after she vanished in 2014, it briefly seemed like there might be a new clue. One of her friends claims she saw Phoenix boarding a flight from Las Vegas to St. Louis, accompanied by two burly men. Confused, she called out her name. The woman turned and reportedly said, do I look like someone? But then proceeded down the airplane aisle. As soon as her friend landed, she reported the incident to the authorities, but the woman in question was never located. Initial reports stated the truck was found running, with its doors open and Phoenix's purse inside. However, in 2018, Officer Kendall Perry, the deputy who discovered the vehicle, clarified to Oxygen journalist Chandrea Thomas that this was inaccurate. He stated, There was nothing to raise a red flag. The doors were closed. The lights were off. The car was just sitting here parked. There was no indication of a carjacking or a struggle or anything violent. It is horrific. Yeah, but it's like the a person is missing. That that to me, that's the red flag right there. It's like you got parents they ain't seen their kid, and you know, however long. Yeah, that to me, it's like yeah, it definitely was some secret life um stuff going on. And I, you know, I have a theory. I don't know if it would be um appropriate to talk on that, but I do feel that it's something more so related to trafficking. I you know, I feel like that that was the best possible way I could put it, that might be the case, I don't know, like, this, you know, part of the video hasn't really ended yet, maybe there might be, uh, um, something that'll, uh, you know, overall, like, give us, uh, um, some more answers, but, I mean, it is an unsolved, you know, case and things, but, yeah, I feel like something maybe trafficking related could be going on, something else possibly, but, anyway, let's, let's just see that Goldia and Lawrence still don't have answers after all these years. The Coldens have criticized law enforcement, stating that their daughter's disappearance didn't get the time or resources it was due because yeah. of the family's race. At the time of her disappearance, Phoenix was between 5 foot 3 inches and 5 foot 6 inches tall and 125 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a dark sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. She has pierced ears, requires glasses, and may have traveled to Illinois or San Francisco. Phoenix is, she's everything to us. She is my only child, and I love her dearly, and I miss her, and I want to see her. I need to see Phoenix. We need to see Phoenix. We need to know. We, we need to know what has happened to Phoenix. If you have any information on the vanishing of Phoenix Colden, please contact the St. Louis County Police Department at the number on the screen. Yeah, that's one of those things where it's like, I'm, 
I, you know, I guess, the, the, all right, so the thing is, is this, I feel that if, you know, a kid is homeschooled, they're most likely not going outside that much. I know they did say she was really into fencing, and uh, yeah, you know, so she probably did have somewhat of a social life, but then as she got older, she probably wanted to explore more. She got into the wrong things, and then next thing you know, like, I feel like that's what led to her um, disappearance. Now, hopefully, you know, um, it's not a situation where she's no longer here with us. But, yeah, it's just, it's something where it's like, you know, hopefully it, it there is at a point in time where she does, you know, see her parents again, you know, and it's like on good terms and things. It's something where it's like, you know, because I imagine, yeah, her family, her parents and family, they're all like, they'll welcome her back um, with open arms. They'd probably be confused if anything, but yeah, it sounds like it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, she... She just, you know, wanted to venture out, and then next thing you know, it's just, it's, uh, and that, that could be the case, too, where it's like an aim in the trafficking situation. It's just, you know, she just doesn't want to be, like, held down, and it's, yeah, and it's something where it's like, you don't have to, but it's like, it shouldn't be a situation where you gotta, like, run away from your family, I guess, to, you know, venture out. Like, there's other ways you can go about it, but anyways... Around 11 p.m. on Friday, April 8, 2022, 18-year-old Dabani Escobar, a student living in Monterey, Mexico, met up with two new friends. The trio began partying at various locations around the northern suburbs of Monterey. Around 3.30 a.m., one girl texted Juan David, a taxi driver they had ridden with earlier that evening, and asked him to take Dabani home. Roughly 20 minutes later, Juan met the girls, and they put Dabani in his vehicle before leaving in a separate car. It is unclear why the girls parted ways, but the two have since stated that Dabani was drunk and belligerent. Not wanting to deal with her any further, they relied on Juan to get her home. Juan claimed that she was rude, but later footage showed the driver attempting to touch Dabani inappropriately. This likely caused her to leave the ride prematurely, jumping out of the car at 4.26 a.m. on Highway 85, 20 minutes from her home. This stretch of road runs between Monterey and Nuevo Laredo and has a violent history of kidnappings and disappearances, leading to the moniker the Highway of Terror. Juan snapped a final, haunting image of Dabani on the side of the road before driving away. From there, security cameras at a nearby transport business captured her crossing the road at 4.29 a.m. She then walked toward the nearby Motel Nueva Castilla, a few hours later, as the sun rose, her parents discovered Dabani's absence and grew increasingly worried. Her father wasted no time in contacting the authorities. A search began, and though Juan was questioned in her disappearance, he was quickly cleared. Local businesses were asked to turn over video recordings, but the motel workers informed investigators that they had none since their cameras only supplied a live stream. Over 200 what? people participated in the 13-day search for Dabani using drones and search dogs. The I'm air like, my, no, the thing is, is this. I, I guess, like, I don't know. Maybe it's different when it comes to security cameras, but I imagine that at some point in time, you have to end this, you know, the live stream. I'm going based on how it is, I guess, because I uh, stream on Twitch. I imagine that there is some sort of video left over. Like, what's the point of having a security camera if it only does a live stream and it don't record nothing? Yeah, something don't seem right with that. I definitely would investigate that business and see what they got going on. But yeah, to me, that just don't seem right where it's like, it, it just, it's only a live stream and they don't record nothing. I guess for those that don't like, uh, do like streaming on like Twitch or even YouTube, whatever YouTube it's in, yeah, something where it's like, you'll see it on YouTube where it's like a person, if they finish up a live stream, there's a video afterwards of that whole stream. And it's like that with Twitch. It's like that with uh TikTok. It's like that with, um, kick. It's like that with everywhere. That, 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 that to me, I'm like, nah, to whatever that business is, I'm like, investigate that business because they know more than what they're telling people. The area surrounding where she was last seen was combed, including the Motel Nueva Castilla, which was searched four times. Tragically, on the evening of April 22nd, Dabani's Dang. body was discovered in one of the three cisterns at the Motel Nueva Castilla. Her belongings, oh. including her bra and phone, were recovered in the other two cisterns. As a brief aside, a cistern is a large tank for storing water. Sometimes utilized for collecting rainwater, they can be above or underground and are usually constructed out of concrete. 
In Dabani's case, the cisterns in question appeared to be mostly buried, with the top section poking up from the ground. One week later, authorities discovered video footage of Dabani at the motel. Security cameras captured several images of her walking and running around the property for 20 minutes. The last image, captured just after 4.50 a.m., showed her walking past a closed restaurant on the motel property and back toward three large cisterns where she was later found. Dang. Initial reports claimed that Dabani's death was accidental, caused by hitting her head after falling into the cistern. Her family, however, didn't accept this chain of events and pushed for a second autopsy. This examination determined that she had sustained sexual violence, died from blunt force trauma to her head, and was later dumped into the cistern. Yes. Tensions between the Escobar family and Mexican authorities continued, leading to her exhumation in July 2022, so a third autopsy could be conducted. The results of her last autopsy found that Dabani's corpse bore no signs of sexual assault and that she had died by asphyxiation. This final investigation also ruled out drowning. In January 2023, two female workers at the Motel Nueva Castilla were arrested and charged with obstruction. These two, a manager and a front desk employee, were responsible for misleading the police about the surveillance footage at the motel. A search of the motel and their homes yielded phones, USB drives, and a laptop that contained the videos of Dabani's last hour. Unfortunately, there has been little movement in the case since. The two motel workers' trials have been postponed until October 2024, and though her parents have worked tirelessly to keep the case in the public eye, Dabani's killer remains at large. They'll figure out something, that's one thing about it. It's like, yeah, it just to me, I'm like, I, I was thinking that where it's like, oh, it could have been a situation where it's like, you know, it might be dark, but I imagine they probably got like lights and stuff. So it's like, you know, you'll be able to see if it'd be some big old giant hole in the ground and things. And I was thinking like, oh, okay, you know, she fell to her death, but it's just, then it's like, you think of it more and it's like, okay, if they say that that area is or road, whatever is known for like having some uh, crime going on. I do feel that she came across the wrong people. And then, uh, yeah, because if they do three different autopsies, one says one, one says the other, and the last one says something else. Yeah, to me, I'm like, you combine all three of those together. It's like, yeah, there's definitely more to the story. So you ain't gonna, my thing is this, fall into your dead. Yeah, I can imagine you'll get some sort of like trauma and stuff from it. But yeah, it's like all the other things. It's like, yeah, you ain't gonna get that fall into your death. So there's definitely more to the story. And I guarantee, yeah, it's ne next month too, when this whole case is gonna start up. Yeah, they'll figure out something. But anyways... Beloved by his friends and family as a devoted, caring, and selfless husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, Michael Chambers was a retired firefighter living in the small town of Quinlan, just east of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Friday, March 10, 2017, dawned as usual, with 70-year-old Michael spending some quiet time with Becca, his wife of 37 years. After she left for work, the pair chatted on the phone at around 8 a.m., Later that day, around 11 a.m., Michael was captured on surveillance footage at a local Walmart. He can be seen leaving without any trouble. However, when Becca arrived home at around 6 p.m., Michael was nowhere to be found. Becca grew concerned and contacted family members and neighbors to see if anyone had heard from him. No one had, though some neighbors showed up to help her search their 10-acre property. Eventually, she made her way to his shop, where Michael spent most of his time restoring classic cars. She didn't find her husband, but instead, several quarter-sized drops of red blood and a wooden oh. dowel rod with blood-like splotches on it. Alarmed, the authorities were called. An immediate search began, with police combing the surrounding property for hours. His truck, wallet, and keys were still there, as were his 12-gauge shotgun, expensive tools, and cash. Mm. Nothing else except his driver's license and bicycle was missing. Becca quickly became the focus of the investigation, she had carried out multiple affairs behind her husband's back, with the latest one ending a mere five months before he disappeared. Additionally, on the day of his disappearance, she exchanged several calls with her affair partner before turning off her phone in the afternoon. Ten days after he vanished, she paused cellular service on her husband's phone, and then, a few months later, had Michael declared legally dead. Wow. Both Becca and her affair partner were questioned, but they were eventually cleared, to learn more about Michael's final movements, a cell phone expert was brought in to analyze his records. The morning Michael left his home, he drove through Quinlan and onto the two-mile bridge, passed the bridge, stopped for 10 minutes, and left. 
Later that day, around 2.30 p.m., his phone pinged in the same area, traveling around 4.2 miles per hour. Then, the signal abruptly stopped. In another twist, the blood found in his shop was revealed to have traces of an anticoagulant in it. Since Michael took no medication that would account for this, police believed the blood had previously been stored in a vial. Authorities hypothesized that Michael staged the scene in his shop, jumped on his bicycle, and pedaled nearly 20 miles to Two Mile Bridge before jumping off of it. Friends and family dismissed this, stating that it was completely out of character. Additionally, he had bad knees that would inhibit such a ride. Huh. In November 2022, a man walking in the woods near Two Mile Bridge stumbled upon a bicycle and a set of human remains. Oh, wow. Immediately, people suspected that Michael had been found at long last, and these suspicions were confirmed in May 2023. Authorities may have finally solved the mystery of what happened to a retired Dallas firefighter who has been missing for six years. Investigators confirmed the skeletal remains found in East Tawakini belong to Michael Chambers. Uh, they were discovered an hour east of Dallas last November. At the time of recording, his cause of death is undetermined, and the investigation, according to the local sheriff's office, is ongoing. Huh. Yeah, there's definitely something weird there. I'm like, nah. I definitely, I'm like, nah, the wife, I'm like, in the mystery. Because, you know, the funny thing, well, nah, I'm going to say funny. I have, like, poor choice of words. But anyways, but, well, I guess, like, in a way it is. Because it's like, I know people are looking at it, it's like, wait a minute, a video game? But, no, there was a video game that I played where they did kind of have a uh, mission in there like that. It was this cop game called L.A. Noir where they had it where uh, the wife had hired, or I don't know if she hired, but she overall had her mistress kill her husband and things. And that... It very well could have been the case. And then they just overall made it seem like that they ain't did nothing. But, you know, talking on the wife and the mistress. But, yeah, I'm like, something like that. That, to me, I'm like, nah. I don't trust that. I don't trust that whole dead. That just don't. To, to me, who my thing is, yeah, it sounds like that. Most likely, um, whoever it was. That, and I guess if they do an investigation where if they go um into they probably even got those phones no more but um no if there is like a way to determine where was the uh wife and the mistress at the time like of the husband um husband's disappearance yeah i feel like that they'll they'll get the answers that they looking for because if they still had the same um cell phones or if they could i highly doubt that um they probably would ever be able to find those phones but um no it's like i imagine they'll probably be able to see okay like they most likely killed them um, dragged his, uh, body off into a truck or something, and then, uh, threw his body off in those, uh, um, or over the lake, and then as his body washed up on, uh, in one of that area where he was at. Sound, maybe that could be the case? I don't know, but it definitely sounds like he was murdered. That don't sound like no suicide, but anyways. In June 2024, 19-year-old Jay Slater left his home in Lancashire, England for a vacation on the Spanish island of Tenerife with two friends. On the evening of June 16th, he attended the third night of the NRG Music Festival at the Papagayo Beach Club in Los Cristianos. After the festivities concluded, he departed the area with two British men he met at the concert, leaving his friends behind. The trio journeyed over 20 miles north to the small mountain village of Masca, where the two men had an Airbnb. On the ride into the mountains, Jay posted stories to Snapchat, one of which boasted about stealing a 12,000 pound Rolex from a fellow partygoer. He chose to stay the night with the men, and at 7.30 a.m. he posted a Snapchat from the same location, showing the doorway of the home and a geotag that identified the area as Rural de Teno Park. Around 8 a.m. on the road outside the Airbnb, he encountered a local woman and inquired when the next bus to Los Cristianos might arrive. She informed him that it would come at 10 a.m., at which point he quickly walked away from her in the wrong direction. She has since said that Jay seemed to be mentally sound, but she was concerned that the language barrier between the two kept him from fully understanding her answer. It is unclear why he didn't ask the men staying at the Airbnb to give him a lift back to Los Cristianos, or so why- why would you even go somewhere? I, look, my thing is this, if I go somewhere with friends, I'm leaving with those friends. I'm not gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna go somewhere with some friends and then hang out with some random people. If I know those people, then I'll hang out with them. If I don't know them, fam, I don't be just hanging out with random people, all right? So anyways. I, he didn't wait for the bus. Some news outlets reported that the men were willing to take him back to his hotel, but they wanted to wait, and Jay was hungry and eager to leave. 
Sometime between 8.30 and 8.50 a.m., he called one of the friends he had come to the island with, Lucy, and told her he was lost and had missed the bus. Sharing that he planned to walk back, a journey that would easily take 10 hours, he also mentioned that he needed water and had cut his leg on a cactus and that his phone was on 1%. The call cut out, abruptly ending their conversation and deeply concerning Lucy. By 9 a.m., she reported Jay as missing. The Spanish Civil Guard began a search that included drones, sniffer dogs, and helicopters, focusing on the location his phone had last pinged, the Rural de Teño National Park near Mosca. While popular with hikers, it is also known for treacherous terrain, and Jay was ill-prepared for a lengthy walk in the wilderness. The case garnered intense media attention, even drawing individuals to Tenerife to aid in the search for the young man. It quickly became a social media sensation in the United Kingdom, rivaling the level of interest seen in the Natalie Holloway and Gabby Petito cases in the United States. The burning question remained, where was Jay Slater? The men he had stayed with the previous night were cleared of any involvement in his vanishing. This had been sharply criticized in the media, with some suggesting that Spanish authorities were in a rush to close the case to mitigate the harm it might have on the valuable tourism dollars. One of the men, 31-year-old Ayub Kasim, has spoken publicly about the case, stating, He came to my Airbnb alive, and he left my Airbnb alive. It was later revealed that Kasim served jail time nine years ago for a plot to bring inordinate amounts of Class A drugs into Wales. Less is known about the second man, and some news outlets identify him only by the moniker Johnny Vegas, though others state this is a nickname for Kasim. Regardless, the investigators insist both Kasim and the second man are irrelevant to the case. The two only remained in Tenerife for an extra day after Jay went missing, and very quickly returned to the United Kingdom. Some have found this suspicious, but Kasim insists his innocence and claims he cooperated fully with Spanish law enforcement. Did you punch him? No, of course not. Mate, what do you reckon happened to him? Both. He had a tragic accident, right? About one month after his disappearance, Spanish police found human remains within the area of interest in an inaccessible ravine. A helicopter was used to gather the corpse, and the next day, it was identified as Jay's body. His phone was recovered alongside his remains, but the authorities have refused to confirm if the 12,000-pound Rolex he allegedly stole at the music festival was also with him. The autopsy found that he had many broken bones and pointed to a fall from a great height as the cause of death. It is still unclear whether the fall was accidental or not, and unfortunately, we may never be fully certain. Jay was not known to have any mental health struggles, and according to his family, he was not a big drinker. Now, after a three-day music festival, he likely wasn't in his peak physical condition, and the results of the toxicology report conducted alongside his autopsy are unknown at the time of recording. In August, his body was repatriated to the United Kingdom, and another post-mortem examination was conducted. Coroners agreed with the initial findings and noted that he would have died very quickly. He can now be laid to rest by his family, who planned a celebration of life for the teen, and asked all attendees to wear blue in his memory. The entire case remains frustrating to the public. How did it take 29 days to find the teen in an area that had, supposedly, been thoroughly searched right after his disappearance? Mm. Although the terrain is difficult and thickly vegetated, this hasn't stopped criticisms of the Spanish Civil Guard, though they remain tight-lipped, stating, we don't give details of the investigation. Unfortunately, we are left with more questions than answers. And it's that type of stuff where it's like, that gives people a reason to question you guys. My thing is, is this, a lot of the times, like when you hear um, of situations with like just whatever case, it could be any old case where even, uh, all right, so the um, recent, the court case had uh, recently started, but uh, for the rapper um, Young Doll, I remember when that whole situation had went down. I think people were saying within that same day, they had already found out who was, I think, one of, it was either both of the shooters or just one of the shooters that killed Young Doll. They found that out within a day. So, and then they were finding out other details. Then you seen it was some days later when they found out, um, then when the police and the people, like, yeah, the actual officials behind the case, when they announced it. So, it's one of those things where it's like, 
I, you know, if I'm working on a case and I feel like that the public can help me, I'm definitely posting some things um, publicly because I'm like, yeah, it might put my job in the situation, but at least then we can figure out how did this uh, kid end up in the situation that he was in. Because that, to, to me, it even just doesn't sound right to me. I'm like, maybe it was the people he stole the watch from that did it, or maybe it was that guy that he was hanging out with, them uh, two guys. I don't know. But at some point in time, yeah, it was like he... It's just not, it's something that I don't believe that it's like, okay, you get lost and then you go into an area where you don't really know too much about it. And it's this like, uh, the area where he, they found his body. Yeah. That just don't seem like an area you're going to go to when you're lost. So yeah, I don't, I don't trust that. I don't trust that at all. If anything's you go and stay on the road and leave it at that. But anyways, did Jay slip and fall that fateful morning or was there someone else in the mountains? Somebody with else. Him? Definitely Unsolved mysteries else. can truly captivate our minds. What are your theories about these five baffling cases? Yeah. Share your thoughts and speculations right. in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more intriguing okay. mysteries. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Yeah, it's just, you know, there's uh, them unsolved cases, man. I'm telling you, it ain't no joke because it's like, they, it's just it, it's so many different like questions that need to be answered and then it's like when there's just all this like these secrets going on with it it's hard to answer those questions so yeah they'll probably at some point in time they'll figure it out all the different things that's going on but anyways make sure if you guys haven't go subscribe to fact faction for more videos like this like subscribe to me too and i'll talk to you guys later thank you guys for watching and peace